didn't um, it didn't pick it up. So yes, I've just pressed record now. Yes, the seminar will be recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. If not tomorrow, then the, the day after. Thank you, Marion. <laughs> um, so without further ado, I will pass on to Catherine and, and ask Catherine to share her, introduce herself and share her slides. Thank you very much. Okay, so maybe I'll introduce myself first. Um, so I'm Catherine Irons and I teach environmental law at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, of course, teach lots of other things, but the main thing in relation to this project is that I uh, did those reports that came out in 2019. Um, and of course, I think they started in mid-2017. So a number of reports focusing solely on adaptation to sea level rise and particularly what the law around what councils can and cannot do um, around, uh, about that. We also did a bit of a, a, a we had a policy focus um, on what are some of the, as a result of that, what are some of those barriers. Uh, and so um, I thought I'll share the screen. Does that come up for you? Yep, yeah, my main slide. Okay, that's good. Yes, that's um, I thought what I'd actually start with is the slide from the Australian Productivity Commission and its report on barriers to effective climate adaptation. It found that councils face a liability dilemma that um, where they'd be sued if they took action and sued if they didn't. Um, and that fear of being sued was stopping Australian councils from taking climate adaptation measures. Um, and that was said to be the single most important issue to resolve uh, in Australia. But interestingly, the solution was said to be um, to reduce liability by providing clear guidance for councils uh, to help them know what they could and what they couldn't do. Um, that guidance is being developed and we have got some uh, significant guidance on it in New Zealand, but it still helps to know what courts are saying <clears throat> councils can and cannot do. So that's where this presentation fits in. What are the New Zealand courts <clears throat> and primarily the environment court saying that councils can or must or must not do um, in respect of climate adaptation? Um, so yeah, I think that if there's one phrase that summarizes the Australian position and likely here in New Zealand as well, it's you'll be sued if you do and sued if you don't. And that perception of liability um, or even just of having to put more money in your legal budget, um, right? That perception of the, having to defend every action you take in this area is a real barrier to acting. Um, so, so there have been at least 19 court challenges to council decisions on adaptation to sea level rise. Uh, as you can imagine, ratepayers might challenge a plan proposal, for example, such as rezoning or changing activity status to avoid development in a coastal hazard area. It might be a challenge to a consent um, that a council has refused, such as for subdivision or building. Uh, residents will sue councils for not acting especially if damage results from that, such as from flooding or slips. Um, and they'll always try and sue councils to force them to act, such as building a seawall or putting information on a limb. Uh, and for those who are not from the limb, the land information memorandum, which records property information um, about identifiable uh, addresses. And someone else can sue a council if they do act, right? Especially if that action caused unforeseen damage. Um, and so that Productivity Commission finding is relevant here that we will be sued if we do and sued if we don't take these measures. But um, so before I address the case studies, I thought I'd mention briefly what I've done and what I haven't, and where the examples in this presentation fit within this bigger picture. First, I finished that Deep South project, as I said, in 2019. So most of the examples were chosen in 2018. Um, so examples from 2019 or 20 haven't been included, certainly not in today's presentation. <clears throat> um, second, I'm only addressing the legal position and thus developments in what courts have said uh, about the law. So it doesn't cover other things happening um, that haven't been to or haven't come out of the environment court. Um, so I'm not including plan changes, for example, for the managed retreat in Matata. If that goes to the Environment Court and a decision is issued, then we'll look at what the court says about it. 
um, and we'll have to wait to see if any court decisions result from the Edgecombe flood and the failure of that stock bank, for example. So those, but those more, I guess, practical examples that haven't then had a decision issued on them, I'm not even covering. Um, <clears throat> so that illustrates the third point here that these examples illustrate where courts think responsibilities and liabilities lie, but they're always issued in retrospect. Remember judges, a situation will arise, say, three or four or more years before the judge will issue a decision. Um, and the rule will come out of the, uh, the judge, I guess, will apply the rules that they think are appropriate to the situation in front of them. So the future position might change, especially in this fast changing area of climate adaptation. So I suggest these examples I'm going to go through are an absolute minimum of what the courts will do in following years in relation to climate adaptation responsibilities, even assuming the same RMA statutory background, which of course might change. Um, so a court might well require more and more of councils in the future, and you often won't know until it actually gets to court. Um, <clears throat> So I have given a number of presentations based on my Deep South reports, including outlining examples of what courts have said about council responsibilities for climate change adaptation. Um, I presented some examples to last year's Solgum conference on climate change uh, and others um, to quite a few non-local government fora. So I thought I should cover different examples today in case you've already heard those other short presentations. Um, <clears throat> though today's examples were included in a workshop that I created for the Hawke's Bay uh, City District and Regional Council. So you can thank Paul Eady of the Napier City Council for getting me to make up the PowerPoint slides that um, I'll be using today. So I've chosen five examples that represent court cases addressing different methods of adaptation to sea level rise. Not all of these have made councils liable. Some challenges to council decision making have lost, um, but they're useful for illustrating what courts have said about council powers and duties in this area. And so the topics are <clears throat> using prohibited activity status to prevent new buildings in a coastal hazard area, denying a subdivision consent in a coastal hazard area, allowing a subdivision consent in a coastal hazard area, but with conditions, a duty to maintain flood protections and council liability for coastal protection works. Uh, in the past, I've addressed resource consents for the building of individual homes in coastal hazard areas and putting information on limbs. Um, so I'm not going to mention those tools today. I mean, unless someone wants to ask questions about them. So let's look at the first one, um, and this comes to us courtesy of the Napier City Council. Um, notice first this case is from 2006, so it is before our current coastal policy statement with its stronger provisions on coastal climate adaptation, and it's before King Salmon and its direction to follow those stronger statements. Yet it still shows the council using prohibited activity status to prevent building in a coastal hazard zone. And that was upheld by the court. Um, so in this case, we have um, four world developments with owning three separate blocks of land uh, in the Bayview um, area. It wanted to subdivide these lots for development, um, but the council proposed a revised coastal hazard zone where new buildings um, or structures would be prohibited. And the Four Worlds land was within the zone. Um, so the coastal hazard zone was determined based on predictions council had had um, to, as being the worst affected by erosion. Um, and so the company appealed the plan change uh, as they have the right to do, but they also um, challenged it under section 85 of the RMA, which I'll show on the next slide um, for those who are not familiar with it. And they argued that, um, that it was effect, it's, it's our equivalent of like a taking um, where they, the, the plan change rendered the land incapable of reasonable use and therefore they should be compensated for it as well. Um, so here's just a, picture of uh, section 85, which said basically uh, the first provision says 
councils can act and normally anything that they do, right, um, is not taken to be injuriously affecting land in the area, except um, if a proposed provision of a plan would render that interest in land incapable of reasonable use, then that owner may challenge the provision and you see the grounds down there at the bottom under 3b uh, that they make the land incapable of reasonable use and it places an unfair and unreasonable burden on any person who has an interest and then so then there's a you know suggestion that the council needs to compensate them for that taking of that interest of land um, however the court completely rejected four worlds claim and upheld the council's position and remember this was in 2006 um, so the, the court was applying a precautionary approach and suggested that Four Worlds actions were inconsistent with that and totally unrealistic in the face of um, erosion of that coast. And un, in relation to section 85, they suggested that the land could still be used for other purposes, such as gardening <laughs> and um, landscaping. Um, so, uh, Oh, is that uh, is the end of that one? Um, so they the forward lost on the um, compensation claim as well. Uh, so that that was a it's a good result for accounts and it shows how you can be justified in using your uh, prohibited activity status and uh, probably even likely even more so today with the stronger um, the stronger coastal policy statement and directions to follow things like avoid you know increasing coastal hazards. Um, oh, yeah, so this quote at the bottom, a reasonable use is not synonymous with optimum financial return is the statement from the court, which is very helpful um, for councils um, and their calculations of what they, you know, of, of the, live, the challenges they might face. So, but here's another example using prohibited activity status. Um, and this is in Christchurch, a few years later, again, still before the current coastal policy statement and King Salmon directions. Um, and it's not coastal erosion, but it's the same, uh, same kind of challenge. And in this case, the Christ, it was a regional, uh, well, yeah, it was a regional and city council um, arguing it over um, uh, allowing a subdivision on flood prone land. Um, and the regional council argued that the flood danger should prohibit the residential construction um, and that's therefore it shouldn't be allowed. And the, the, the um, regional council's claim, right, was actually particularly worried, um, no, they were particularly worried about residents coming in. It's like that uh, reverse sensitivity argument. Residents would come in and then expect the regional council to take steps to prevent the land from being flooded because it was already occasionally flooded um, and if you put houses on there people would suddenly start wanting it not to be flooded. Um, so the regional council was the one that sought prohibited activity status to have for any residential development. So what did the court say about that? Um, the court actually declined and they made a comment about prohibited activity status saying it was the most draconian form of control available under the RMA and should not be imposed lightly. Um, but they also did think that the regional council was overstating the risk. Um, there was only going to be minor effects if the subdivisions were to go ahead. Um, so I thought, that, so the lesson that's normally taken from that case is that you can use prohibited activity status to justify um, preventing additional development, but you can't use it as a blanket crude uh, tool and you have to be um, careful. Um, about how you do. This unfortunately though does make councils a little bit more careful to think of when they can use it or not. So you're going to have a, you might have to be thinking more about comparing, you know, the conditions in one case with the conditions in the other, but then the revised conditions in the coastal policy statement. I think you're more likely to be able to use it, but you've always got this worry about, you know, what, what the courts are going to say along the FACA line. Um, so we have now another type of tool, and this is the denial of a subdivision, um, not on prohibited activity, but just not appropriate from that area. So in this particular, in the Carter Holt Harvey, actually, is in, in Carter Holt Harvey, um, I do a search, look for the case, you try and bring it up, and Carter Holt Harvey's been involved in a lot of cases in the Environment Court around New Zealand. 
and this is against the Tasman District Council um, in 2013. Uh, so after the current coastal policy statement, so that was applicable, but before um, uh, Davidson or King Salmon. Um, so Carter Holt Harvey proposed to put a subdivision on the uh, on this the sand spit around the Muteri Inlet, and you can see an arrow in the top of that picture, which with the road around it, um, that's the land in question. So you've got the sea on one side and an inlet on the other, um, and interestingly, the um, sorry I'm gonna the because of the, the known risk of uh, inundation um, and certainly over time there were a lot of conditions proposed and offered by the developer so for example they suggested uh, relocatable buildings with trigger points for when the sea came in a certain distance then these buildings would be removed they proposed a 90 meter setback from, from the sea, 90 metres for all the building sites, um, a 28 metre setback from the inlet. They also proposed a $40,000 bond to be given to councils in case buildings weren't to the council, in case the council end up having to remove the building because the owner didn't. Um, erosions were based on a uh, nearly a 0.9 one metre sea level rise but with some precaution built in. Um, it you probably can't see very easily on this picture, though I think it's on the next one, uh, you might be able to see the road that comes around that services to the white line there, that services the subdivision. Oh, I should say there are only, there were first going to be eight, but only six residential lots proposed, so it's not large. Um, but that road that services it already gets overtopped by storms um, and, and, and some high tides. Uh, so there's about at least 300 metres of the road which is regularly closed. Um, so, there's, so the access was not good um, and the suggestion was after 50 years all of the proposed esplanade reserve outside the lots would be covered by the sea. So 50 years there'd be all of the buffer zone would be gone as well as some of the residential lots themselves and after 100 years um, half of the lots would be completely consumed um, uh, with approaching the building platforms hence the trigger points for the relocation um, so this the Carter Holt Heidi was, was the council declined the consent due to that high risk of flooding and damage um, and they declined it under section 106 which gives um, councils the power to decline it where there is significant risk from natural hazards. Um, and so, of course, that description I've given you so that the subdivision was both likely to be subject to what you would call material damage and sufficient um, provision for legal um, and insufficient provision for legal and physical access. Um, so what did, so Carter Holt Harvey appealed the denial by the Tasman District Council. What did the court say? Well, first, here's section 106, um, which gives that uh, consent authority the power to decline, which refers to that significant risk and sufficient provision for legal and physical access. Um, and then it's got a reference to uh, material damage. And so court, of course, is looking at all of these tests to see, have we got you know, that term material damage satisfied. Um, and is it, you know, what is sufficient provision for legal and physical access to each allotment? You know, what is a significant risk from natural hazard? So the court has to assess to see whether those thresholds are met and to see if the council then appropriately had that authority to decline under this section. Um, so the court defined material damage in section 106 as significant, so it actually sort of, uh, I wouldn't say conflated the two, but yeah, used um, the significant term in one uh, to help define the other, and said that the description I've given you, that around half of the lots, if not more, would be eroded by sea within 100 years as um, significant. <laughs> it's difficult to describe that loss as anything other than significant. Um, and because of the access that was already highly vulnerable and was already overtopped, they said to be viable that needed to be raised, but there actually weren't any proposals to do that. Um, and so the court um, concluded uh, that the material damage to the Esplanade, uh, no, sorry, I already mentioned the Esplanade Reserve would cover, would come within 50 years. Um, and while the residential damage might not occur until after 50 years, 
but it was definitely between 50 and 100, and we have that 100 year time frame within, um, uh, within the jurisdiction that we have to provide for. Um, but none of those consent conditions, which were about removal of buildings, none of them were to do with avoiding, remedying or mitigating the effects of erosion on the esplanade um, or on the land in the lots. Um, it was more like what to do when you get there. And none of them were directed at the access. Um, none of them are, you know, avoided, remedied or mitigated the problems with the access. They were all about giving the council some money to help maintain the existing um, road when it actually needed to be raised. And so Carter Holt Harvey lost and Tasdrum District Council won. So there's an example. Again, it's a, it's a challenge. The council stood to put money into the legal fight. Um, but uh, as more, you know, I think it's fairly clear now that you would uh, be well justified in denying some of these. But I'll go to the next example. And you'll see actually that this is a very different result in a similar situation. So now you suddenly think, oh, we've thrown a spanner in the works. Um, Mahanga, another Hawke's Bay um, example. And in this uh, example, consent was actually granted um, for land to be subdivided into five sections. So it's very similar to the six in Karaholt Harvey. Um, although it wasn't consented there, but um, Mahanga uh, Etu appealed on the basis that the land was at serious risk of erosion um, and one day it would become unfit for residential occupation. Um, so the subdivision itself wouldn't increase the risk, but you couldn't prevent the erosion, very similar to Carter Holt Harvey. And it was predicted that only 20 years use of the site could be obtained, so that's even less than Carter Holt Harvey, right? Only 20 years use. Um, yeah, sorry, that's on, on that list there. So what did the Environment Court think of this example? Um, actually, as I say, the court focused, had this lovely quote to do with voluntary assumption of risk. And in previous cases, like in the, in the Holt case, which I've talked about in other presentations, which was one where they allowed a house to be built in a coastal hazard zone on poles with a boat tied up to it because of the um, Dunedin City Council's uh, focus on voluntary assumption of risk in its plan back then. That's changed now, so it would be decided differently now. But they focused on that voluntary assumption of risk, which has appeared in some of our other cases, particularly in relation to individual building consents. And uh, they actually allowed this development Right. So this development was permitted to continue, but what they did differently was mandate these conditions, though interestingly very similar conditions to the ones in Carter Holt Harvey that were thought not to mitigate that particular risk. Um, homes would have to be built so as to be able to be relocated. Right. They had a trigger point that they would have relocated when the ocean eroded to within, uh, ocean eroded the land to within seven meters of their house. Right. Seven meters is quite close. Um, but that, and that was predicted to be in 20 years. And to make sure that these houses were actually removed at the time, then a bond of $35,000 had to be paid by the developer, I think per house, just in case those costs would later have to be paid for the council. And just uh, in case you're wondering why, um, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an issue of safety. Um, you don't want power lines, sewage pipes, you know, things like that, that are sitting there in a house suddenly being subject to being overtopped by waves, you know, sitting in the sea um, and breaking and either electrocuting or poisoning people. Um, so it's, it's interesting that the risk they thought was acceptable and the risk is what was mitigated by the removal requirements. The risk was known and accepted um, by the applicants. Um, so this is different from most other climate adaptation cases. Um, however, you do read it, I think the land is slightly, or certainly less hazard prone than the Gallagher case, which was denied. That's another Tasman uh, one, which I've talked about before. Um, the development was small, though again, so was Carter Holt Harvey. Um, residential development here significantly was, was already classified as a discretionary activity. So there was a lot of discretion for the council to be able to put them in or not. Um, and 
uh, yeah, there's other ways you can distinguish it from, say, later cases like, like Gallagher, but I'll be honest, um, it does make you wonder whether this one might be decided differently today. I mean, it, it might given the greater risks that we see. So that's something that unfortunately, even though we have this case study that when you go through it, you think, well, okay, you can see how it sounded justifiable at the time, but you think 20 years, I'm not quite sure that um, uh, most of it, that it, well, this will continue to be like, for example, to fit within the Ministry for the Environment uh, guidance or the other technical um, working technical working group guidance, put in the precise name, sorry. Um, so, but that, that is an interesting one to put, you know, also to, has to be considered when any council is wondering whether they will win or lose a decision on an application for a, um, uh, to either approve or not a subdivision in a similar situation. So um, I'm gonna to go to another example. And this one is to do with flood control. And this is not RMA, I'll be honest. This is not RMA, but um, it does illustrate uh, council liability for maintaining flood um, uh, protections. So the situation in this uh, Manawatu uh, River case is that um, it was 2004, the Manawatu River had um, apparently its third largest flood on record. And it flooded a lot of agricultural land with two and a half million dollars worth of damage. Um, there was found to be a catastrophic stop bank failure. And it was caused because of the closeness to a bridge that had been built to form part of a highway. Um, uh, so the plaintiffs, in this case, the farmers mostly, claimed against the council on a number of grounds. They claimed negligence, um, private nuisance, uh, Rylands and Fletcher, that's strict liability, and a breach of their statutory duties. Um, so what was the outcome? Well, the first one is, oh, I thought it was going to come one at a time, sorry. Just a look at those one at a time. <laughs> the first one, the regional council was subject to be found, uh, was found to be subject to the liability under Soil Conservation and Rivers Control Act, but that statutory wording barred civil claims except negligence. So the court could look at negligence. Um, they found in relation to negligence, the court found a duty of care owed to the plaintiffs and there had been a breach. There had been the like they had not maintained that sufficiently, not paid a sufficient attention to that stock bank. However, the court found that the claim failed because of causation. And the reason for that causation, uh, that difficulty, um, is that the uh, they thought the flood banks probably would have failed anyway because of the size of the rain um, event and the amount of water coming through. So in that sense, you could say the council was lucky. Um, because they were found to have breached a duty of care. It was just lucky that the breach, um, the actual uh, rain event was so big uh, that it didn't matter. Um, they, maybe they can help contribute, but they, they weren't found contributory liable. So it shows you that an action in negligence against a council is possible in respect of a duty to maintain flood and coastal hazard protection works. And that duty um, can be owed, or in, in this case, it was owed to ratepayers. So that's quite likely to be the case in any other council situation. Um, ratepayers who are protected by the works that are there. But you may also find that it, you know liability will require um, proof of causation, and that requires looking at the the size of the flood and um, the the actual particular failure and how they interacted. So you might be lucky, um, but you might not. So be very careful about maintaining existing flood and coastal protection. And the last example I have actually uh, is, is Van Dyke. I have actually given this one before, but this is um, a very useful uh, example to show when councils have a council in this particular case, but it could easily be applied to others. Council has been found liable for a coastal protection work that it uh, established, it proposed, it built, it caused damage, and it was forced to take it out <laughs> and uh, at, a, at an even bigger cost. So in this particular case, um, there was a groin that the council 
um, constructed. And it was in order to control the flow of sand within a shipping channel. And if they thought if they built the groin, they wouldn't need to dredge the channel so often. Um, and it would, yeah, it, would, it would be better for the general ship and port movements. Um, however, it did, I mean, it was very effective and it stopped the movement of sand. And what it did was it stopped the replenishment of this beach um, near where the Van Tyke's family home and a number of others you can see on this spit were located. Uh, and it caused um, significant erosion of the beach and up to the land. So it kept retreating. I think I, I haven't got the number in front of me. I'm sorry. I think it was 35 meters. Um, so yeah, I'm looking at the number. I'm sorry about that. So there was an interim injunction issued by the Environment Court preventing um, further work and requiring on the groin and prevent and requiring the council to undertake protective measures. All right. Um, and they required the groin to be removed. And you can see the cost there, cost the council, the Tasman Council, uh, $638,000 to remove and then an extra $457,000 for shoreline maintenance, more than a million dollars just as a result of um, uh, the building of, you know, on top of the cost to build that groin in the first place. Um, but then it had to come back to court because the Van Dykes were saying, okay, you've stopped the damage occurring, but what about remediating <laughs> the damage that's already occurred? Can you put 35 meters of beach back? <laughs> you know, that's an awfully large solution. Um, and so the Environment Court considered that in 25, uh, 2014. Was the council also liable for the long-term remedial solutions for that whole spit um, and uh, this, this, the Van Dykes family home? And they argued, the Van Dykes are arguing that a channel needs to be dug, all right, uh, and, you know, you need to put more sand back. Um, but the court actually declined for the second claim. They declined mainly because it was too large. Um, well, first, you couldn't, the court couldn't order a channel to be dug because that would require a resource consent and they didn't have all the information that you would need in order to order a resource consent for that work. Um, and they didn't think it sounded like sustainable management, it fitted within sustainable management. Particularly the cost far outweighed the interest being protected um, and by millions of dollars. Uh, and so I've mentioned that second one, the resource consent there. With, and the effect of the channel was unexplored. Um, they didn't know what other side effects, a bit like the groin. You know it's going to do what you want it to do, but will it do something else that you weren't expecting? And the same maybe could be said of the channel. So the court ordered that the council monitor the spit for a further three years. Now that has actually expired. I don't know what's happened to that since. Um, but I do think it's a really good example of you, you don't have a duty to build a seawall, for example, a coastal protection work, but if you do and it has unintended consequences like causes erosion somewhere else, because it will, it will change the flow um, of the water on a beach or, or you know, in a channel, wherever it is, uh, then you're going to be liable for the damage you cause. And um, uh, as well as remember under East in the previous case for flood control, and you're also therefore liable to maintain it. So once you've got a wall, it places expectations, but also you can't cause more damage than you were trying to prevent. Um, so that's, it's a really salutary lesson for councils because uh, particularly council ratepayers with houses that want protecting are always arguing for a seawall. Why he has got a, uh, there's a separate case study uh, that I've got going on in relation to the why he wall, which the environment court said don't build. And then they went to a minister who said, yeah, you can build it because of a political pressure overrode the legal. I think in this case is where you don't want your political pressures to be overriding your legal standards here because there's a real good reason for having those legal standards. Um, much as we all want our homes protected sometimes, we just have to realize that it's just not a good idea. Um, I could make analogies with, you know, farming in certain areas of the country and fresh water. So you, much as you've got a lot invested in it, it's just not a good idea in some cases. Um, so I see that that is now right on 1240. Um, so I'm thinking I should, start, I mean, those are my five examples. Um, I can certainly talk about any other examples like the housing on stilts and, you know, those kinds of challenges or 
building individual houses and zones. But I thought I'd give you that little snapshot of a range of different tools. Um, uh, maybe the takeaway is for councils, you will actually have to be undertaking adaptation measures. Um, counts, the court has forced councils to put information on limbs. You have some discretion how to do it, but you're going to have to do it. Um, so it's going to be a duty. Uh, there is a duty, um, but you're going to have to put more money into your legal challenge budget because people are going to fuss. Um, and you're going to have to do it anyway. What? What can we say? Just do it smart and win those challenges. Okay, I stop. So I stop my screen so sharing. And thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and thank you for for wrapping up within time. That's fabulous. And I know that we're going to have a huge number of questions, so um, we will crack into them straight away with the hope that we um, that we get through them all. Uh, for anyone who is wanting to pose more questions, can you please make sure that you reference the case that you're asking about, um, just um, because it, it'll it'll just help us and, and help our future viewers as well. So um, there is a first question which I think might provide some good context. The question is, um, the first two examples you described, one of which was Matata, is not to do with sea level rise. And I thought perhaps, Catherine, you could talk a little bit about the interrelated nature of climate impacts if you wouldn't mind. No, you're completely right. Marta is not one that was based on sea level rise, but the tool that they used, and the it's the same kind of justification um, of trying to prohibit residential dwelling in a hazard zone. Okay, it's not a coast, I mean, they happen to be on the coast, and the hazard was not a coastal hazard, um, but it is still a hazard zone, and you could apply the same reasoning to uh, erosion, sea level rise, you know, um, inundation generally, um, particularly say from, you know, storm uh, events that have produced damage um, in some cases. So councils are looking at the same kind of tool. Can they get the regional council to use one of their tools under the RMA to change um, what kind of land use is allowed in an area and prohibit residential dwelling and the local council will also simultaneously change <laughs> their plan and prohibit residential dwellings in that area even so this is not in advance of uh, a subdivision for example um, which some of the cases have been about when they're proposing to subdivide and it's made prohibited um, but what about when this house is already there and if suddenly that's prohibited, then they have to leave because there are a lot of residential developments in coastal hazard zones and councils uh, have really unclear powers as to what, what, how they can deal with, for example, managed retreat. Um, you know, can they force residents to retreat from a coastal hazard zone? So then we don't aren't put in the situation, you, just as in, I mentioned in relation to Mahanga, um, or you know, where you've got buildings sitting in water with live power lines, broken maybe power lines, broken sewage lines as a result of you know damage suffered in a storm, and they're just sitting there in the water, dam you know posing a risk to everybody else. Even if you disregard the risk to lives from people living in those risk areas, a lot of courts like uh, what do you call? Um, voluntary assumption of the risk. You know, a lot of people like to say, it's my life, I'm allowed to risk it. Um, but then what are we going to tell rescue services that you that there, there's a do not rescue <laughs> notice because you voluntarily assumed a risk. You put other people's lives at risk when you live in these zones. Um, and so councils like to say, we're gonna reduce everybody's risk and we want to force you to retreat. We don't have the tools, but so we look at something like Matata to say, well, could we use that kind of tool? So that's why it's a, test example it could be very very relevant to climate adaptation sorry very long thank answer but I hope it's you, explanatory i think um it's uh, the, the 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 thing is that every question leads down a garden path but we might need to keep it fairly short because we have so many questions i'm sorry um just a couple of mahanga questions uh one of them is why would the council perhaps be liable for removing the houses down the line and the second is It'd be interesting to know how these houses were dealt with under the Building Act, given the minimum time frame is 50 years. Did they get consent under Section 113 of the Building Act? 
Um, okay, so first, um, why was the why might the council be liable for removing them? Uh, that would really be a, a council choice. I wouldn't necessarily. I didn't say that they would uh, necessarily be found legally liable to remove them, but councils might, as it would want to remove them in order to reduce risk. Someone would feel the need that these houses had to disappear from that area, you know, for the other risks that they would pose if they were just left to be inundated by the sea. Um, and if a, if a landowner didn't, I mean, it's a bit like what you call toxic waste sites. If a company goes bankrupt uh, and leaves and leaves a toxic waste dump, then the government seems to be left to clean it up. It's that same kind of approach. It's just a matter of fact, usually. Um, and I don't know what the situation is in relation to existing um, houses, but I do believe that they have got some houses, so they must have done something there. That's a good question, though, about the building act. I need to follow. I've been looking at more of what courts are saying than following up examples on the ground with what's happening in practice with real life. Thank you, Catherine. And also, um, everyone, we will be recording these questions and, and it's fine, trying to find a way to respond to them in a more um, comprehensive way at some point down the track. A question from Sylvia Allen. Um, Section 106 of the RMA was modified since the Carter Holt Harvey um, Tasman case. Have you considered whether the decision would still hold now? No, that, that, that is a good comment. I haven't. Um, I have started going through some of them. I've looked at the Holt case, not Carter Holt Harvey, but the Holt case in Dunedin. I looked at the Hemi case. Um, uh, and, and I've actually done an article on redeciding the Holt case. Um, but I haven't done it for all of them. And my next one was going to be Mahanga, actually. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's just there's, just, there's just too many interesting things. I'm working on a water conservation order in Te Waikorupuhu Springs right now. I'm not doing climate adaptation <laughs> for a couple of months. Um, so I haven't, ex yeah. So I was just looking for this project at, here's what courts have said. Uh, and indicating, I indicated in the report, well, here's some reasons why they might not still hold but I haven't then gone and like re-decided to say, if we go back and look at the facts and the plan and all that stuff and how it would actually work out. Thank you. A question from Olga Filipova. Uh, where would the house relocation requirement be recorded? Would it be on the limb, on the title, um, for example, at Mahanga Itsu? Um, That's a good question. I would be, if it's a real condition, if it, hmm, it was certainly in the resource consent, which is it was that was in the subdivision consent, um, but you would because that's what these cases were about. You would as because it wouldn't you it wouldn't be on a land title because it's not a condition of owning the land. It would be to do with the building and the resource consent, um, surely. But uh, which is what yeah yes I'm just looking at what the court said the rules were. But where would you do it in practice? I mean obviously council would have that on a limb as well. Okay. Um, a question from Tom Fitzgerald. Given the unique nature of each of these 19 plus cases, all hinging on slightly different points of law, context, scientific method, outcome, and all costing huge money, I wonder what your thoughts are on the role of the courts in adapting to climate change at the coast versus better policy, whatever that is. Oh, Great oh, question, Tom. Yeah, um, it, this is, we, we're doing it in a stupid way. <laughs> we should not be doing this one. We, I mean, most of our... You could, I mean, there, there are some, there would, there would be lawyers in other countries and civil law systems who have a lot more written down in the rules. Everybody knows what the rules are when they start, who think the whole common, our whole legal system is ridiculously um, archaic and slow uh, and expensive. We actually have a failure of justice in our whole country because our courts are too expensive to access. Um, and so we don't, we're not doing the right thing because we're afraid of going to court. We have, uh, you know, homeowners, I mean, you know, you can, all councils will know plenty of examples of homeowners who feel they've been shafted by developments in the areas and don't feel they've had any ability to challenge, even if there might be a good legal ground, but they can't even go to court because they don't even want to pay a lawyer's fee to be trying to do this kind of stuff. So um, it, yeah, I agree completely. We need to have rules. We also need to have, uh, even within our current system, we could have much better guidance. We could have a national policy statement on climate adaptation. You know, we, where there's been a good suggestion, we're going to have, you know, from the Randerson panel, that we're going to have a statute. Um, so you can't control for 
<laughs> the home phone ringing <laughs> in the background. Um, so yeah, we're gonna. The suggestion is we'll have a national adaptation statute um, along with Sorry. Zoom. We're all used to it, Catherine. <laughs> it's the first time this happened. I put my put my cell phone on silent. I never thought of the home phone. <laughs> Move it to a different room. Um, uh, Can you give uh, us so some general insights into the impact of the proposed managed retreat and climate change adaptation bill, Catherine? I know that this is what you're working on at the moment. Yeah, not really, not really, but um, I can I can just say that I mean, any any guidance is better than none at the moment yeah. for councils, and it will be absolutely essential. Um, of course, you know, I don't know how long it's planned to take, but if a statute like this, well, if you have to wait for RMA reform, that doesn't sound fast. Um, but their national policy statements have been particularly slow as well. Uh, and this is one, but we've got a climate commission with an adaptation mandate as well as mitigation. Uh, and we've got you know, Judy Lawrence and other really good people who um, know what they're doing in this area. Uh, we might get some really good rules. I mean, there, are, there is good guidance now and the courts have said councils have to do it, but there's still a, what do you call, I don't want to say a setup, but there's still, you know, you've got to get going on the science for your area and we've got to you know employ all of those um scientists to say well what is coastal uh what is the coastal hazard in our particular area you know is the land going up or down while the sea goes up and you know what are the mapping and the likelihoods um so you do have a lot of factual stuff to be getting right but you also yeah have to have that policy coming in and we definitely shouldn't be doing it one house at a time one objection at a time to the environment court Okay, um, a question from Christina Griffin. Um, she's, it's in reference to the um, Van Dyke versus Tasman, but I think it's just a general, it's a good question generally. What are council liabilities regarding the function, functioning of existing coastal and flood protection mechanisms into the future? Do they have to be upgrading those to adapt to future sea level rise and flood hazard predictions, etc.? Well, the, no, that's a really good question. You've got, there's a, if there's a duty to maintain existing flood at the moment, there's a duty to maintain existing flood protection, right? But there's also a duty to mitigate coastal hazards. Um, and counts, uh, courts, um, you know, laws will take into account costs and benefits. So like with Van Dyke, we're not gonna make, you know, do make you pay say $3 million to protect 20 houses, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, at what point do the different duties and responsibilities say that you do or you don't have to increase an existing wall? Um, given what we know about the inevitability of um, uh, sea level rise and coastal erosion, uh, well, I say inevitability generally, obviously every particular spot is different. There are some areas where they're accreting with sands being deposited on the shore and you know you're getting more land so everyone everyone has to have their particular situation assessed we'll just say generally there's an inevitability of erosion and sea level rise and some destruction of some property you can't you know be the king canoe you can't keep holding it back sea walls can only be temporary so there has to be a point at which you say we can't keep protecting those assets and so you might be protecting your um your airports for a bit longer <laughs> than maybe some residential housing, some of the bigger infrastructure. But I mean, just think about it. There are so many airports close to the sea in this country. You know, Auckland, Wellington, Napier just come straight to mind. Um, and we certainly shouldn't be building extra runways in any of those places. Um, but at what, so, but for a while, you've got to protect what you've got, certainly the big ones, um, but you certainly have to look, have that view to relinquishing. A question from um, Jer Jeremy Bennett. I'm skipping through them to try and give us a bit of a variety of questions. Sorry, everyone. Um, at the end, I might propose some suggestions for how to continue a conversation because obviously there's huge need for it. Um, but Jeremy asks, does uncertainty about sea level rise and climate change impacts, for example, multiple scenarios, affect court decisions? And if so, how is, is uncertainty considered? Does uncertainty could having multiple scenarios affect the court decision? Um, well, yes. Uh, I, no, I'm going to say it's, I mean, it's obviously hard for courts to just make, you know, you, they've got to come down on one side or another. 
and you've got different risks and possibilities. Um, but courts are used, or getting used to, certainly considering these. Um, they, they know, I don't want to say they, uh, they do know what precaution is, but at the same time, there's so many, there's not one rule because you've got so many different types of risks. I mean, the environment court, think about it, will hear, will hear cases in relation to like the storage of explosives and that kind of risk. Right, nothing to do with sea level rise, and we're, but it's a it's a very clear risk. But you know what would happen if something happened, you know, and this thing just went up, you know, by accident, right? And all the way through to um, like like populations of shags as a result of feeding grounds being disturbed. <clears throat> you know, how precautionary do you have to be in relation to saving a species? You know, then to different scenarios for climate change, and we don't actually know which one's going to play out because we don't know what, how, what our human responses are going to be in 10, 20, 30 years time, as well as the natural interactions. So courts are used to handling different types of risk, but at the same time, yes, it's it's hard. So you need to get, um, so they get a lot of, grit, uh, of science evidence. So does that affect cases? Uh, yes. <laughs> Now, I, have I remembered all of the question? Maybe not. Have I answered all of the question? I think you've given it a good shot, Catherine. Okay. Um, we've probably got time for two more questions if we keep them quick. I'm going to ask this question from Marion. It's on a new sort of topic area uh, from Marion Schoenfeld. Um, in Christchurch, we have people who stayed in the red zone and the City Council has to maintain services at great cost for the benefit of the few. We have rising groundwater affecting pipes and roads. All else being equal, flooding will increase. I'm interested in how we can use changes to level of service under the Local Government Act as a tool in adaptation or re eventual retreat. Mm. That's a really good question. Um, I sympathise. Uh, now, if you want to stand back and not think about, you know, individual people, you know what I mean? And the individual people who's who are, are very attached to a particular situation um, or a particular place, um, and you just want to stand back and think of more objectively as a whole, as a, then yes, it is silly to be putting that many public services for the benefit of the few. And if you wanted to apply the same rule that courts are applying in other situations, um, then they wouldn't be supported. Um, Often, though, politics, you know, and of, of dealing with individual people and their circumstances overrides the, you know, the, the more objective think of the group. Um, so that's really hard to deal with daily. I do agree councils need more help with dealing with it so they don't, you know, they aren't being seen to be the bad guys, not paying attention to individual uh, needs. Um, and desires. Thank you. And one final question from Terry Moore, which um, I think is a is a good place to end, um, and then we'll wrap up after after this. Um, can New Zealand learn from overseas places with more dire current sea level rise risks, for example, the Netherlands or Florida? Uh, have they gone further, faster in evolving environmental law in this area? That's a good question. We have seen in quite a few, I tell you, I haven't looked at the Netherlands laws, um, but I have seen some examples, particularly in the USA, which are ones of what not to do. Um, surprise, surprise. But they have, and a, a very good example is in relation to their flood protection insurance. And they don't have, so there's a national flood protection insurance. So even when private insurance is retreating, that the individual property rights and that attachment to that concept is so strong that the political, uh, there's a real political impetus to provide that insurance to protect individuals' houses, to protect individuals' properties. And so they're given national flood protection payments and they rebuild right where they were before. And it keeps happening. There's no use of, say, national, like EQC equivalent um, insurance payouts to reduce the risk. There's just, they're just talking about it now, um, but there's, a, there's just a whole ethos in the States which has led to that situation. Um, so, so they're not even in a supposed free market situation. They're not letting the free market dictate. So when free market pulls the insurance out, the government goes, oh, I guess, we, and there's a clamor for it, I guess we have to provide it. Uh, so that's one thing I would say not to do. Um, you don't 
yeah, there and a lot of examples about how to have how not to behave in relation to the science. Um, there, you know, in Florida especially, there's a lot of climate. There's a lot of fighting about. We're not even want to mention it because we don't want to say it exists because that's politically not in line with where we want to be in terms of parties. So um, there's there's a lot of physical. There's a lot of tools that we can take from overseas and uh, that would that we'd be able to use. You know that the Netherlands and other places are looking at. But most of it, and like you say, Florida, some of the examples, Florida, or well, most of that is just, is like raising buildings, letting car parks become flood basements, you know, underneath the building, um, that kind of stuff. Is that really what we want to be doing? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so either. And I'm hoping that um, all the hundreds of attendees um, here today agree with you, Catherine, um, which is a slightly, um, uncertain place to finish the webinar today and just on time. First of all, I just want to um, say thank you so much, Catherine, for all this um, just huge amount of work you're putting into this um, research area and it's changing quickly and we will try and keep on top of it. Um, I've just been hearing from one of our partnerships directors, Waverly Jones, that there are plans, Solgum have plans to host a climate forum, an adaptation forum later this year. And um, they're also proposing to run another webinar series before Christmas. Um, so, but I, if I could ask everyone here today to lobby your, your managers, your leaders, your CEOs, your local MPs to, um, you know, make more space and time and make more resource available for this discussion because um, it's clearly required. Stay tuned for the next seminar, which is Belinda Story looking at uh, insurance retreat uh, with a case study in Tauranga and uh, that's on December 2. And please, if you haven't already, join our mailing list, although I'll probably um, do that for you as well. So thank you so much again, Catherine, and thank you everyone for joining us. And I hope you have a lovely Wednesday. Bye.